Well, all right, everyone. Welcome to Naturalist Nights. This is brought to you through a partnership between ACES and the Wilderness Workshop, and we'd like to thank our sponsors, Alpine Bank and the Lodge on the Roaring Fork. <laughs> oh, yeah, getting official here. My name is Howie. I'm a naturalist here at the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, and it, it truly is my pleasure to introduce today Dr. Dan Blumstein, Stein. Sorry about that. I, <laughs> I started off on the wrong foot. We're focusing a lot on vocalizations today. And, you know, I, I stumbled right at the beginning, but hopefully this will be a good note as we step into this presentation. Now, Dan is the department chair and a professor at the University of California, Los Angeles in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And during his summers, he comes up to the Elk Mountains, up to Gothic and to Crested Butte, to do a little research on my favorite Rocky Mountain animal, the marmot, the yellow-bellied marmot, the rock chuck, the whistle pig. <laughs> and he has a lot of great stuff to tell us, so why don't we cede the floor to him and everyone give Dan a great welcome. Thanks, Howie. Thanks for coming out on uh, this uh, sort of a holiday. Um, and I th I'm sure there are a lot of other fun places to be tonight, but hopefully I'll uh, give you something to talk about at the pub later on. Um, so what I want to talk about are marmots, and I want to talk about a saga that started in Pakistan, actually, and that's it, it, sort of uh, where I spent a lot of time in Colorado and then sort of ended up in Hollywood, where I'm based these days. But I want to put marmots into context. There are 14 species of marmots. They live around the northern hemisphere. I've studied um, eight of the 14 species. And I ask questions with marmots about their social behavior and their communication and their anti-predator behavior. And they're a good system to ask these sorts of questions because they all kind of look the same, but they vary in their sociality. And as you'll hear in a few moments, they vary quite a bit in, in what they say and how they say it. Um, now, you know, I, I like marmots. Um, a lot of other people like marmots. But marmots, there's actually a holiday named after marmots, and it's called Groundhog Day. So the groundhog, or the woodchuck, is one of the 14 species of marmots. So we all know about Groundhog Day. It's the only holiday um, that celebrates an animal. It's the only, Turkey Day doesn't count. And it's the only holiday that, that um, uh, really is about animal behavior. And I study animal behavior. So I mean, this is a big thing for me. And really, it's the <laughs> modern celebration of Candlemas Day. So <laughs> pagans in Europe years and years ago, and later the uh, Christians in Europe, Catholics, I believe, uh, celebrated Candlemas Day, which is a midwinter festival. Now, I live in Southern California, where I don't need a midwinter festival these days. <laughs> but many people in yeah. you know, the North need midwinter mid festivals. <laughs> and the idea was that years and years ago, um, uh, people uh, came up with this ditty, if Candlemas Day be fair and bright, come winter, have another flight. If Candlemas brings clouds and rain, go winter and not come again. And it, they, they tied this to hibernating animals, and marmots are a hibernating animal, but, but in Germany, um, they tied it to the emergence of um, hedgehogs. So when the Pennsylvania Dutch, Germans settling in Pennsylvania, came over to the US, they were looking for something that hibernated that sort of came out in the middle of the winter and they found the woodchuck. And you know, the woodchuck um, comes out, actually males emerge first and they're going around looking for, for wives or waking up their various wives. But um, they get up and the idea is that if it's sunny and they see their shadow, um, there's probably a high pressure system. If there's a high pressure system, things aren't gonna change too much. And if they don't see their shadow, it's cloudy. Maybe things are changing in turmoil, and maybe spring will come sooner. So that's sort of the logic, the meteorological logic behind Groundhog Day. Now, Groundhog Day became famous to most Americans in a movie. Um, groundhogs, by the way, you can tell them always because they have big ears. When you start looking at rodents for an inordinate amount of time, you begin noticing differences amongst them. <laughs> and, and the groundhogs have big ears. Uh, but we, generally in the US, we just don't respect our, our, our groundhogs. We parody our animals. But if you go to Europe and you go to Switzerland, for example, you can see statues um, made for marmots. If you go, yeah, if you go into many places in the Alps, you'll see marmots in, <laughs> in, in apothecaries and in, in pharmacies. That's because their fat is used medicinally as an anti-inflammatory agent. And um, you can you know, use their fat for that. They're hunted and, and harvested in Switzerland and other places as well. In Switzerland, there's a zoo that contains all 14 species of marmots. If you're a marmotophile like me, you've got to go to this place. Um, it's above Montreux. You take the funicular railway up, and at the top, they actually got live animals from, from uh, all the different species. And you can 
um, you know, visit them there in the summer at least. In the winter you ski over them. Marmots are kept as pets in Russia. One of my Russian colleagues, this is his house marmot, Chermuk. Um, this is sometime around Groundhog Day. He doesn't let it hibernate. Um, and it's his, it's his pet. Um, nice coat of fur on that thing. And it turns out that in Russia, Janice, my wife, and I were at a uh, marmot meeting there a number of years ago, and we were studying some marmots in, the, in, in Russia. And uh, they, as part of the marmot meeting, they took us to a fur farm. Now, uh, fur farms are horrific places. You know, most of the animals there have stereotypies and, you know, running around their cages and not very happy. Um, this is the steppe marmot, and they're breeding it for a good coat. It's a very social species, and they bred them in family groups, and they had them in large cages. And these were really happy animals <laughs> with really beautiful coats. Marmots end up on stamps, even in countries that don't have stamps, or don't have marmots, rather. Um, <laughs> We, of course, issue a first day issue of the woodchuck or the groundhog, but we don't do it on Groundhog Day. I mean, come on, what's that about? I mean, we really don't get our marmots. June 13th, 1987. Now there's this beautiful big tundra um, sort of collection of animals that has a marmot and pike and other things on it as well. I don't think that came out on Groundhog Day either. Um, some species are endangered, critically endangered. The Vancouver Island marmot was down to below fewer than 30 in the wild, and through a process of captive breeding and reintroduction, um, the wild populations uh, slowly being saved. The Olympic marmots um, seems the population seems to be crashing um, just across the straits from Vancouver Island, and some other species are being over harvested in the old world. But um, around here, we have lots of marmots, and if you study behavior, you want to have something that you can. You know, don't spend all your time finding them. So what I want to talk about today um, is a lot about alarm communication and the sounds animals make when they're scared. So I want to talk about what alarm calls are and why we might want to study them. And you know, I'm sort of telling you this from the perspective of an, acad of an academic biologist who is interested in explaining behavioral diversity. So we see species, much as people are interested in explaining biodiversity, why we see species where they are and how we you know, how species diversity is maintained. I'm interested in why we see animals doing different things, why some species are monogamous and others are polyandrous and others are polygynous. Um, you know, why species say different things, um, why they do different things. So um, I'll talk about alarm calls quite a bit and all stories have to start, you know, in Pakistan, don't they? And then um, I'm gonna talk about, you know, when are they, these alarm calls produced and what do they mean? I'm gonna talk about whether marmots cry wolf and, and talk a bit about individuality, why individuals sound different, and suggest that reliability assessment is a really important part of um, why individuals sound different, at least with their, respect to their alarm calls. I'm gonna talk about fear screams and something I call the non-linearity hypothesis, which took me directly from Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory, yellow-bellied marmot pups screaming in my hands to Hollywood. And then I'll end up with film soundtracks and the sound of fear. Um, so we'll see. So. Buckle your seatbelts. So all stories start a long, long time ago in a place far, far away. And, you know, there is no money in what I do. I mean, <laughs> there just isn't. Um, I, I run the, the, the Marmot Project at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. We've studied marmots. My colleague, Ken Armitage, started studying them in 1962. I wasn't even born then. Um, and um, the project continues today. This will be our 50th year of continuously following marking, trapping, trapping, marking, and following the fate of individuals throughout their lives. It's an unprecedented data set that allows us to understand why populations go up and down and how climate change is affecting species. And um, the U.S. government, National Science Foundation, has $2 billion that they give for long-term research. And I've been able to get none of that. Um, Two million is nothing. I mean, think about the average salary of a baseball player. Think about, you know, the least well-paid baseball team. If that's how we sort of view um, these long-term data sets that allow us to understand population dynamics, allow us to understand how the environment influences species, write your, write your legislatures. I mean, this is, this is it's worth lobbying about. Um, anyway, all stories start a long, long time ago in a place far, far away. And because I'm in a field with no money, um, when I was a graduate student, I was reading widely about what to study. And, and I stumbled upon Herodotus, who was like the first travel writer. And he was writing, in this land, there are ants that are in bigness lesser than dogs, but larger than foxes. Some of them have been hunted and captured and kept at the palace of the Persian king. These ants make their dwelling underground, digging out the sand in much the same fashion as the ants do in Greece. And the sand that they dig out has gold in it. So where was he when he was writing this? It turns out he was in uh, Skardu area, in Indus Khoistan. 
um, in, in present-day Pakistan. And it turns out there are people in this area that are gold washers. And what they do is they go outside marmot burrows and they take this soil outside marmot burrows and they wash it for gold. And Herodotus was not talking about ants, he was talking about the golden marmot. So I went to Hunza, the home of the golden marmot, where people are reputed to live a long time because they eat a lot of apricots. And it turns out, I don't think they live a long time, I think they just age quickly because they have a really hard life. But in this spectacular location in a park called Khunjurab National Park, which is right above a little finger of the um, Wakhan Corridor, which is a little piece of Afghanistan, and right on the Chinese border is this big national park. And I studied marmots there for a number of years. And um, one of the things I was interested in and became very interested in while studying marmots there is alarm signals and alarm calls. So, you know, Dr. Doolittle, Dr. Doolittle could talk to the animals, but how does one figure out how to talk to the animals? Well, it helps if you have easily identifiable stimuli, a fox, and then you have, a, you know, an individual saying something, you know, chirp, 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 when that fox appears, and they don't say it in other contexts. So people study alarm communication in part because you can figure out what elicits calls and you can do experiments to elicit calls and you can then begin cracking the code and understanding um, what animals are saying. So it turns out that this is a family tree of, of the 14 species of marmots and these are voice prints or audio spectrograms. On the x-axis we have time and on the y-axis we have the frequency or what we perceive as pitch and the grayscale represents relative amplitude. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play these prob mostly from, from top to bottom and you will be some of the very few people in the world who now have heard all of the species of marmots. Now, these are alarm calls and they're very different. <coughs> and if you know birds, um, you know when, you know, for lots of small passerines, if a, bird if a raptor flies over, they start psh, 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 or they seat. And there's a lot of convergence in the vocalizations, alarm vocalizations of birds. But what you'll hear here, 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 is remarkable divergence. And one of the questions I'm interested in is why? Another question I'm interested in is why do some species have one alarm call while some species have four or five? So let's sing along with the marmots and listen to their calls right now. Himalayana. Siberica. Kamchatka. Papacina. Bobak. Caudata. Mensbury. Browerai. Marmota. Normal and then start high. Monax. That's the ground. Olympus. Part. An ascending, a descending, a flat, and a trill. Olympus. Caligata. An ascending, a descending, a flat, and a trill. Vancouverensis. Ascending, descending, flat, kiaw, trill. Flavaventris. A whistle and then a trill. There's a dog breathing in that one as well, but um, five of interest, yellow-bellied marmot, that's the one that, that, that's around here. So large repertoires evolved once in this sort of new world clade of marmots, group of marmots, and that, you know, we can see call structure is very flexible over evolutionary time. So calls, these alarm calls, could be directed to the predator. They could basically signal detection to the predator, I've seen you, and for predators that um, who hunt, who require stealth and surprise, being detected means the game's up. Um, they could d discourage pursuit, essentially. They could also be directed to conspecifics. Maybe you want to help warn your relatives. Maybe you want to help warn your kids. Maybe you want to help warn other relatives because the name of the game in evolution is having your genes survive to the next generation. Um, they also can create pandemonium. So, you know, if I scream fire, everyone starts running around, um, and there you have it. Maybe I can then escape the predator because I confuse the predator because lots of individuals are moving around. Um, in rodents, however, it turns out that uh, mm -hmm. we went and looked at 209 species of rodents and we asked if there was any evidence that calls, alarm communication, alarm signals evolved um, socially. And the answer is no. Actually, um, that, that 
alarm communication evolved in rodents when they became diurnal. So nocturnal rodents don't really alarm call, but when, when different lineages become diurnal, then you see the evolution of alarm calling. And alarm calling, um, diurnality is more associated with alarm calling than is sociality. So the original function of this probably was to tell the predator to, to bugger off. And subsequently, um, animals have uh, evolved rather um, interesting and elaborate intraspecific communication mechanisms. And a lot of people study that these days. So I work over the hill in the summers, the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. And as I said, this is the home of a now, this will be our 50th year of studying marmots in the wild, where um, basically we, we, we run a soap opera. We catch animals, we mark them, we follow them throughout their lives. And um, we're using this as a, among other things, a, a sort of a window on how climate's affecting animals. One of the things we've noticed over the last 30 years, at least, is that marmots get up a day earlier every year. So they're emerging from hibernation a month earlier than they were 30 years ago. It's getting warmer, too. Um, before I became chair, I would have to tell my, my chair, got to go to the field earlier this year. They're getting up earlier. But now that I'm chair, I don't really have that excuse, and I'm not able to go to the field as early as I want to. So my lucky students and postdocs get to do that. But, um, you know, these long-term studies really are priceless, and they give us insights that um, you can't get from a normal ecological study. Most ecological field studies are about two or three years, which is how long it takes someone to get a master's or a PhD. So a 50-year-old study is, is unique. So what makes animals call? Um, one of the things we noticed was that when we trapped marmots, sometimes some individuals alarm called and sometimes they didn't. And it turns out that when we walked towards them, um, they, those individuals that had a higher propensity to call when they were in a trap also were more likely to call when we approached them. And it turns out that when we, on the rare occasions when we would watch predators interact with the marmots, that same thing. Those individuals that were more likely to call in the trap were also more likely to naturally call in response to predators. So um, we capitalized on the fact that we trap them all the time, and sometimes they call and sometimes they don't. And we also capitalized on the fact that they poop in the traps quite a bit. So we pick that up because we're biologists and put it in Ziploc bags and freeze it immediately. And you can learn a lot from poop. Um, you can um, learn um, endocrine profiles of animals. You can f ask questions about what their stress hormones are because stress hormones are circulating in the blood, but they're excreted in, in feces and urine. So you can take these um, poops back to the lab, extract what are called fecal, fecal glucocorticoid metabolites. That's the digested stress hormones that, that come out. And then you can say, okay, well, what happens? Is this associated with calling? So we had a data set that had 29 adult females, breeding age females, and on one occasion they called in a trap, and on another occasion they didn't. And the question is, um, what's going on with their stress hormones, glucocorticoids? Turns out that individuals who called had systematically higher glucocorticoid levels than individuals who didn't call. And the take-home message from this is that we think this, this suggests that um, stress levels explain some of the variation and why individuals make call in, you know, on, on certain occasions. Um, some animals are generally nervous and maybe their stress levels or their uh, stress hormone levels are generally high. So individuals have personalities, marmots have personalities, anyone that has a pet knows that individuals are different. Well, marmots are different too and some of them are nervous Nellies and some of them are cool hand Lucy's. And that's an important thing to remember for a few moments from now. So what do these calls mean? A lot of people put a lot of effort into understanding why, when animals call, um, why they may call, what the, who the target of the calls are. But you know, like Dr. Doolittle, I want to know what, what animals say and what these calls mean. Um, we're sort of obsessed with this in the sense that um, people are interested in how language evolved. And the National Institute of Health fortunately was wise enough to, to give me some money so at one point to go out and look at a lot of different marmots to understand the evolution of meaning in, in alarm calls. And um, calls could communicate the degree of risk. They could um, basically say, I'm really scared or I'm not that scared. Or maybe a predator is really close to me or a predator is really far mm -hmm. from me. So response urgency or degree of risk is something that calls could communicate. And people had said that animals, all animal communications like that, it, it can't, it can't Signals can't refer to objects. Only humans can label things. But 
Um, Functional reference, some species do label things. Some species do have words, nouns for various things, or can give precise directions. So the waggle dance of bees is a really good example. Bees can tell other bees you know, where food is, how far it is, what direction it is, and even the quality of it um, by dancing in the hive when they come back to the hive. But people say, oh, those are bees. We don't care about bees. But mammals, that real animals can't you know, talk, don't have words. Well, some species do. Um, and, and, and some species, you, there's good evidence, like in meerkats, which I think are pretty cool animals, um, a bit of both. They can communicate the type of predator, and they can communicate um, sort of the risk associated with the predator. And we'll come back to meerkats in a moment. So I you know, read the literature, and some species of marmots have been said to have these functionally referential calls, calls that um, were, were if a eagle flew over, you only would ever hear one sort of vocalization. And if a fox or a coyote or a dog came up, you'd hear only another sort of vocalization, and there wouldn't be the mixing. Mm -hmm. So, and then some species that I was uh, that I'd already studied, I didn't see that, and I said, well, marmots are a good system to ask what what you know selects for this word-like communication. So we went out and we observed and listened to marmots, <laughs> and it's. Uh, you know, we only see so many predators in the field, so we bring out Robo Badger, who marmots really don't like, um, and Eagle Knievel, um, so named because that, that's Ken Armitage, the guy who started the Marmot Project at Rumble, holding Eagle Knievel. Eagle Knievel is a, a glider painted brown. Um, uh, you know, Janice would be watching a marmot with a microphone, and I'd be up on the hill somewhere, and I'd throw the thing down and try landing a glider in an Alp rocky alpine meadow. So it would break into pieces and I'd glue it back together and <laughs> go out the next day and try it again. And it would break into pieces and glue it back together. Every time I put, glued it back together, it got heavier and heavier. It flew faster and faster and it crashed, you know, more and more. Eagle can evil. <laughs> so we go out and we observe and, them and listen to them and do playback experiments and ask them what they think about various vocalizations. And it turns out, don't believe anything you read in the literature, except maybe what I'm writing. Don't believe anything I'm writing either. But um, there is no species that I studied of these eight species that, that has good evidence that they have word-like communication. But as a biologist, so as a person trying to understand the evolution of human behavior, this is somewhat frustrating. But as a biologist, this is really exciting. They have different numbers of vocalizations, and you can ask questions about what leads to repertoire size. So repertoire size, even if they're all, communi all about communicating risk, is an essential prerequisite to having words. You've got to say different things. And they have different mechanisms by which they communicate risk. So some of them have different call, call types that communicate risk. Some of them um, vary the number or rate of calls. Some of them as you get closer to them, they call faster, and, or they have more calls. And some of them, as you get closer to them, they call less or have fewer calls. If you're calling less, maybe you're trying to make yourself more, less conspicuous. If you're calling more, maybe you're really talking to the predator. Yellow-bellied marmots call more and faster as you approach them. Um, um, that's the groundhog. That's the steppe marmot in Russia. That's the golden marmot I studied in Pakistan. That's the yellow-bellied marmot. That's the alpine marmot studied in the Alps. That's the Olympic marmot. That's the hoary marmot. Um, I studied them in Mount Rainier. And that's the Vancouver Island marmot. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So a lot of really interesting behavioral diversity. We've cracked the question of number of calls. Um, in, in marmots and in ground squirrels and prairie dogs, more social species have more calls, um, which is interesting more socially complex species have more calls. So aside from communicating risk, yellow-bellied marmot calls, when you start analyzing them and listening to them and, and um, making all sorts of measurements on them, have other sorts of information. They contain information about age, sex, and identity. So age is an easy one. If you're small, you can't produce low-frequency vocalizations. You sound like a pipsqueak. Um, so that's what, you know, that's mostly what age is, how age is encoded. But sex, there are characteristics of these calls that vary based on the sex of the animals that aren't necessarily frequency dependent. And identity is a really interesting one. They're individually specific. So if you go out and you know, listen to the same animal again and again, it's going to sound different than the animal next to it that it, you know, is going to be individually, uh, individualistic. And like, that, that sort of raises an interesting question, and that is why produce individually distinctive vocalizations? Now these are alarm calls. If you look at other systems, other animal problems um, that, that where we see individuality in vocalizations, 
in some cases we see group or territorial calls. In some cases, animals converge on a particular group call when they form a group. Um, dolphins, other marine mammals. Um, in many species that forage in loose aggregations or dense aggregations where they get separated, they're, they're making contact calls, keeping in touch with everyone. A lot of primates do this in the forest. Other animals do this as well um, when they're foraging through <laughs> dense, dense cover. Um, calls that aid in the recognition of young by their parents. Um, crushing animals, um, bats, uh, penguins, uh, uh, seals. They drop their kids off, they go out to forage, they got to find their kids again. Strong selection on the parents to, to distinguish the kids because they got to get the food to the right one. And strong selection on the kids to say, mom, you know, and to make sure that mom knows who they are. So all these systems make a lot of sense. But alarm calls. Alarm calls are only given under duress. They're not given all the time. They're not territorial calls. They're alarm calls. So why are they individually distinctive? Maybe it's to assess kinship. If that has some benefit, that's a um, uh, an important driver of a lot of social behavior. But a um, number of people have suggested that it helps individuals assess caller reliability. And that matters if you've got nervous Nellies and cool hand Lucy's. And we know marmots have personality types, and we know they vary in their degree of stress hormones that are circulating. So if you think about this, um, a nervous Nellie might be one where a leaf drops, nervous Nellie's calling. And cool hand Lucy, you know, the mountain lion walks up and she's kind of looking at the thing and then eventually calls. So if you're, if you're a marmot trying to figure out what to do, people have said nervous Nellies cry wolf. And we have a fable about crying wolf, that you ignore the boy who cried wolf and you shouldn't be crying wolf. So it behooves the individual who's listening to these calls to tell individuals apart. So it's really hard to study this without doing experiments. So we did a rather nasty experiment. Um, we went out and we used Robo Badger. We took him off his chassis and we put him out in the meadow and we covered him with a tarp. And then we basically hosed the meadow with 10 minutes of novel calls from one individual, pulled off the tarp. So the, these novel calls, calls recorded from another social group, different part of the valley, um, th this, these individuals never heard, were associated with the presence of a, a, a predator that they really don't like. And then we created um, an unreliable individual where we did put the badger out, covered him with the tarp, but never pulled the tarp off and played the calls of another individual. We replicated this a number of times. And we basically did this as a learning experiment where we had pre-tested each of these individuals to see how they respond to both of the calls. And then we post-tested them after we did this little teaching experiment. And what we found was the opposite of the boy who cried wolf. So the way we did this experiment is we baited these animals in and then we looked for changes in foraging behavior and changes in the amount of time they look around. They always respond to the alarm calls, but eventually they habituate and get back to foraging. And the question is, if the, and, and foraging and the boy and, and vigilance sort of are traded off. So you got 100% of time. If you're spending 50% of your time foraging, you're probably spending the rest of your time looking around. If you're spending 80% or 75% of your time looking around, you're not foraging much. Foraging is a little more sensitive in this case, but it, it trades off with vigilance. So what we found was marmots foraged more while hearing the reliable caller. So, oops, this is the difference in um, post minus pre in terms of foraging and the reliable caller, they're foraging more than when they heard the unreliable caller. I don't really believe any experiment, but this is the exact opposite of the boy who cried wolf. Um, and I don't really believe any experiment. And when we first did this, I'm like, we must have transposed our numbers. There's something wrong. We looked at every, recalculated everything, and it's right. So we did more experiments. We found out um, that there are at least three lines of evidence that reliable individuals or reliable situations, in some sense, are discounted. First, marmots forage more while hearing a caller artificially made reliable. Um, marmots forage more while hearing undegraded and therefore presumably higher risk calls. What's that mean? So when animals produce sounds, they travel through the environment and they lose amplitude and they become degraded. Their fidelity is decreased over distance. So when you broadcast something, if, you, if you're an alarm calling, caller and you're screaming, um, your, your call will be degraded. It'll sound different at a distance. So if you record these calls uh, cl close by and then far away, they're going to be different. A lot of species are really good at estimating distances based on that. So we played these things back to the marmots and said, okay, if I'm 
hearing a caller that's really close to me, clearly that caller is at risk, so I'm probably at risk. So this is a more reliable situation. As opposed to, if I'm hearing someone calling from very far away, then you know, that individual could be at risk, or I could be at risk, but I don't really know what. So it's sort of a less reliable situation. Turns out, marmots, far, marmots forage more while hearing undegraded and therefore presumably higher risk calls, which again is the uh, opposite of what you might expect. Marmots forage more after hearing calls from older animals as opposed to potentially unreliable pups. So baby marmots, you know, they, they innately call, but they sort of have to, have to learn what to call to. And if you're small, more things are scary. So they're calling to things that adults shouldn't necessarily be afraid of. Yet, they sort of ignore, you know, they, they forage more after hearing calls from older animals that are essentially more reliable. So three lines of evidence that, reliab that reliable individuals or situations are discounted. Now, this is the exact opposite of what people had found with vervet monkeys, bonnet and rhesus macaques, step marmots, Richardson ground squirrels, all of these, you know, were basically the boy who cried wolf. Marmots forage less or looked, or these animals forage less or looked more after hearing calls from reliable individuals. So why do yellow-bellied marmots discount these calls? I thought about this a lot, and I think it makes sense to some extent. I mean, the boy who cried wolf also makes sense, but unreliable individuals or situations are unreliable specifically because it's difficult to assess the true risk of predation. You don't really know what it is. You don't know if they're calling to a leaf or if they're calling to a real predator. Um, unreliable calls and situations elicit independent investigation. Everyone responds immediately, but th these unreliable situations, if a reliable individual, you know, Fred, Fred's really reliable, Fred calls, um, you know, you look and you say, oh, he must have made a mistake and you go back to what you're doing. But an unreliable individual, you don't know, so you keep looking. So I think, again, this illustrates evolutionary flexibility and mechanisms. And I think that the real question now that I haven't been able to answer yet is why do we see systems that function this way versus systems that function as the boy who cried wolf? So what makes these differences in, in, in how animals map reliability onto um, response? And I think, I was sort of a skeptic going into this reliability research because I wasn't happy with how some people had done some experiments or I, I think it's really hard to estimate reliability naturally. Um, but I've become a complete convert and I think that reliability assessment really is, um, does drive individuality in alarm calls. And that's really interesting, um, to me at least. Yeah. yeah. Uh, ask a question. Sure. So the Vancouver Island monarch species had five different the Vancouver Island marmot species, the one about to go extinct, has five different vocalizations. Is that because, I don't, I'm just guessing, speculating here, more predators? Huh? Yeah, so, so the, the question is, you know, do they have more predators and does that drive alarm call diversity? And marmots are really good to study this because they all look kind of the same. Mm -hmm. They all have the same general suite of predators. All of them have terrestrial predators. All of them have aerial predators. Um, you know, pretty much all of them have something that's going to dig them out. They, both, they all have felids. They all have canids. So, no. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't think that's it. Um, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're, they're very social, and sociality seems to select for um, a rich repertoire. Um, what's really interesting is, I'm not, I'm not really presenting this, but they have simple syntax as well, that they communicate risk by having different types of vocalizations, but if you change the order, you change the response. And that, you know, syntax is something that is, is also a characteristic of language, and people argue about whether non-humans have syntax or not. So we lose a species, we lose the ability to understand, you know, drivers of our diversity. So the sound of fear is, is, is site-specific. Um, where I'm from in LA, it sounds something like this. In Gothic, Aspen, something more like that. That's the sound of a baby yellow-bellied marmot screaming. Um, I never heard this in any other marmot I worked with, although I've trapped yellow-bellies more than I've trapped anything else. But the first time I heard this, I wanted to, I almost dropped the animal. Um, baby marmots um, call, or scream, I'm sorry, um, 
within about nine days of emergence from their burrow. So they're about a month old, they're born in the burrow, they spend about 32, 34 days in their burrow. They're mostly weaned when they come out. Um, and then for the first nine or so days out, they have some probability of doing that. And it's really interesting to everyone around them. Um, mothers come out of their burrows when we're holding them and they, you know, they scream. They don't come out of their burrows when they're alarm calling, but when they're screaming, they come out of their burrows. And my response of, oh my God, I broke it, you know, I'm gonna drop it, um, you know, it sort of really grabbed me and said, well, what's going on with these screams? And, you know, why scream? Darwin, who, by the way, never saw, as far as I can tell, a marmot or wrote about a marmot, poor Darwin, um, did write about screams. And he said that screams are calls for assistance of young to their mothers. Um, screams in general are emitted by highly aroused individuals. And I wanted to know whether sc they, screams were typical alarm calls. Do so they function as typical alarm calls or is something else going on? Alarm calls structurally have a very simple harmonic structure in many cases. So here's sort of the fundamental frequency and a bunch of harmonics uh, off an alarm call. Um, you can see two different yellow-bellied marmot alarm calls. They look a little different. They sound a little different, mm -hmm. but similar structure. Um, these are meerkats, coolest, one, something, the coolest animals on earth. Meerkats are cool. Um, but meerkats have referential vocalizations. They have aerial alarm calls and terrestrial alarm calls, but they also communicate risk. And the structure of these aerial or terrestrial calls change as the predator gets closer and risk increases. And they change in a really interesting way. They get noisier. So here you sort of see nice, clean, little harmonic type things. And up here you see more gray stuff there. That gray stuff is noise or deterministic chaos. And here we see this you know, blurry sort of thing. And here it was very clear. Um, turns out that's not uncommon. When you produce a sound, if you're a mammal at least, um, you blow air through your larynx and the air coming out of your larynx then has to travel through um, your throat and out your mouth. And I'm gonna try to do this, but the source is the air being blown through the larynx and the filter is everything else after that. So I'm gonna start humming, ho, or not changing anything I'm doing, I'm changing the filter. So a lot of um, vocalizations can be thought of being produced by this sort of source filter theory of production. And if you have some asymmetries in your filter, you're going to begin having asymmetrical airflow, and you're going to have asymmetrical sounds, and you're going to start creating things that bioacousticians and acousticians and really physicists talk about as nonlinear phenomena. So what's coming out is not a predictable consequence of what's going in. So you can Nonlinear nonlinearities, nonlinear phenomena are are ways of describing a system that is linear within a particular parameter space and then becomes less predictable, if you will. So you turn up your stereo, sounds good, gets a little louder, sounds good, gets a little louder, sounds good, gets a little louder, and then it sort of breaks and it starts getting staticky and it starts jumping around and you know this quality of the sound goes down. You've exceeded the linear range of that system. Got a horn blowing through a horn. I can't blow through a horn, but if you can blow through a horn, you put the right amount of air through, you get a nice note coming out of your trumpet. If you blow it too hard, it gets really raspy. You've overblown your horn. Same thing with these sorts of systems. And what are produced are these various nonlinearities, these nonlinear vocal phenomena. So there are a whole bunch of them. <coughs> these are rhesus macaque coo calls, but you can identify things like subharmonics, uh, bands of energy between harmonics. You can deterministic chaos or noise, all this gray stuff. Biphonations or side bands, which if, if you have a harmonic, you've got little bands around it. Warbles or abrupt frequency transitions often are characteristic of these things. So we know a lot, and there's been a lot of ideas about how they're produced, but no, there are very few ideas about why they're produced. I mean, what, what's the function of these nonlinearities? Now, when I started listening to these screams, I started realizing that lots of species have these screams. I'm gonna apologize at the outset. These are um, recordings from hunting suppliers where they torture some animals to record them and then hunters go out and play them and then predators come in and they shoot the predators. So here are a variety of different screams. That was a cottontail rabbit. It's a gray fox. It's a white-tailed deer being, not, maybe nothing good happening to it. Um, and and, and the, the, these screams are really convergent. They're very 
there are a lot of attributes, these nonlinear attributes that are convergent among many different species. So yellow-bellied marmot alarm calls, they communicate risk by varying the number and rate of their calls. Whistles are the most common call type, and these whistles are individually distinctive. And we wanted to understand what's going on with these screams produced by these yellow-bellied marmot pups within about nine days of emerging from their burrow. Not all of them scream, but when they do, we try to record them. So yellow-bellied marmot pups can produce whistles, the normal alarm call the day they emerge from their burrow, and they sound something like this. <coughs> but they also produce screams. And um, you can make a whole bunch of measurements on them, and you can begin looking at them, and you can start seeing evidence of bifination. You can see warbles. You can see subharmonics. You can see deterministic chaos or noise. All of these nonlinear attributes, all of these, um, in all these things indicating that the system, the system is being overblown in some way. And the alarm calls don't have that in the same degree made a bunch of measurements. Screams um, differ from calls on all measured attributes. Importantly, they're longer in duration and they have a lower frequency. Now that's interesting because the lowest frequency an animal produces um, is a function of its body size. In fact, the lowest frequency is, is generally an unbluffable um, signal of body size. Frogs use it when fighting. The deeper croak means the bigger frog. And you know, most animals don't really want to get in fights. So if I croak deeper than you, you know, you'll walk away. Um, so uh, body size is, can be communicated by, by the lowest frequency. Well, these guys, by producing these subharmonics, are producing lower frequency sounds. Maybe these are trying to dupe the predator into making them believe they're bigger than they are. Yellow-bellied marmots can fight predators. Um, I started studying anti-predator behavior in marmots in part because um, I watched a fight between um, a golden marmot and a Tibetan red fox, and the marmot won. So, uh, you know, they, they can fight, and, and maybe they're trying to tell the predator to drop me, I'm going to get you. Maybe they're trying to call in other predators to get a little fight going on between the predators, in which case the pup will survive. The pup does not survive the predators. The pups are killed left and right. Um, maybe they're trying to, you know, call for help in an unbluffable way. As I said, when we're working with these pups and they scream, it's not uncommon to have a mom come up and look at us, um, which isn't too good. Anyway, these screams um, <laughs> frequently had noise or deterministic chaos. They had subharmonics. They had bifination. They had warbles. They're also highly individualistic. Are they more evocative than alarm calls? So we broadcast them back to marmots. What we're looking at here is a baseline response in the proportion of time foraging. So we have, before we broadcast anything, marmots are eating our bait about 60% of the time. The first 15 second time bin, um, we broadcast an alarm call from an adult, an alarm call from a pup, and a pup scream, and they immediately respond by decreasing um, the amount of time foraging. They always respond by looking. And then over time, they recover and they go back to foraging. If they hear alarm calls or pup calls, they recover faster than if they hear pup screams. So pup screams are evocative. And people had said the only hypothesis for the function of these nonlinear non vocalizations is that they um, are hard to habituate to, that they're evocative. So this is evidence of that. Does scream duration influence responsiveness? Before I realized that there was all this nonlinear stuff going on, we realized that you know, the, the duration of these varies. So um, Janice, my wife, spent a long time trying to synthesize using some computer software that isn't very user friendly, an average pup scream. And that is our average pup scream. And then once we had an equation that could describe this, we can make it shorter or we can make it longer. And we did a playback to the marmots, and it turns out that long screams suppress foraging more than adult alarm calls, average screams, or short screams. Mm -hmm. So scream duration does influence responsiveness. Now, you know, I, I, I talked about all these convergent vocalizations. So chimpanzee pant hoots, when they start, <laughs> Um, they're overblowing their system. They're getting noisier. Dog barks. You all know the difference between a dog who's sort of barking and a dog who's really upset. You all know the difference between a, a, a baby that's crying and a baby that's really crying. Um, macaques, um, you know, piglets. I'm not going to do a piglet, but piglets. Uh, you know what piglets sound like when they sort of get upset. So I'm going to suggest that I think the sound of fear, or maybe more generally the sound of arousal, may be nonlinear. 
And then these nonlinearities may be evocative because they're unpredictable, and this creates an honest signal of fear. So we did a playback experiment. We took a normal adult marmot alarm call, and we put some noise into it, and as a control, we took some sound out of it. So this is five milliseconds of noise, and that's five milliseconds of silence. And you can hear the difference in these. It's subtle, but the second one is going to be a little raspier. And the marmots respond <coughs> more to the one with noise added. Mm -hmm. So silence, no difference than alarm call control. Noise added, they forage less. So um, there's something going on with this, with this nonlinear, um, with, with noise, which is one type of nonlinearity, and maybe nonlinearities in general. So marmots to movies. I'm giving this sort of a popular version of this talk um, at a conference, interdisciplinary sort of popular conference talk. In, in LA, and I said, you know, I bet um, movie soundtracks tap into this, and I bet musicians tap into this. And afterwards, a guy came up to me and said, I'm a, I mean, you don't bump into marmots in LA, but you bump into a lot of people in the industry. <laughs> and this guy comes up and says, yeah, I, I'm a film score composer, um, retired from that now, working on a PhD, trying to look at the emotional uh, evocativeness of, 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 of music, and trying to really take a very biological perspective, and I think you're right. And I said, let's collaborate, and we did. And the question now is, if humans respond like non-humans to non-linear sounds, then composers and audio engineers, or at least the ones with houses around here, can capitalize <laughs> on this and evoke emotions. And maybe they don't know about non-linearities, but they know what works. They know how to manipulate people's feelings. So we asked the question, do emotionally evocative soundtracks incorporate noise and non-linear analogs. And I say analogs because this isn't the sound produced from an individual. A soundtrack has um, diegetic sound, the natural sound in the environment. It's got Foley, the sound effects that are added. It's got dialogue and it's got music. So all of these things together create a very rich tapestry of sound. But if we look at this mess of noise, and it really is a mess of noise, and it took us a long time to figure out how to measure these things consistently and repeatedly. Um, if you look at this mess of noise, can we find noise? <laughs> can we find abrupt frequency transitions? Can we find warbles? Can we find biphonation? Can we find subharmonics? The, answer's, um, the answer will be yes. Um, but what we did was we then said, well, you know, what sort of emotions might be evo evoked? We used databases to sort of find the best war movies, adventure movies, horror films, and dramatic, sort of, you know, sad dramatic films. And we went in and looked at iconographic scenes from these films and, and, and scrutinized their sound. Here's an example. <laughs> Janet Leigh's first scream was a real scream. Um, and it's in part because Hitchcock didn't tell her he was going to turn off the hot water. Um, after that, it became, <laughs> it became, you know, more dramatic screams. But her first scream was real. Um, and it was noisy. And you can see side bands, and you can see abrupt frequency changes, and you can see amplitude fluctuations. All of these things that are characteristic of, if this were an animal producing this, or a natural system producing this, all of these would be called nonlinearities. I'm going to show you a bunch of these. These are the number of films that have in black or don't have a particular attribute. And the little asterisks illustrate when something is not what is expected by chance, chance being um, basically um, in proportion to the number of films there were. So sad films suppress. There are fewer noisy sound effects in sad films, or at least in these iconographic scenes of sad films. Um, I'm really doing this because I want to understand why I cry at movies, right? So there's no noise. Um, sad films enhance abrupt musical frequency changes, while horror films suppress them. So think about it, you know, cue the violins. <laughs> Music comes to the foreground, lots of string instruments or other things They're going up and down. Um, so these abrupt frequency changes are enhanced in sad films. Sad films enhance musical sidebands um, while horror films suppress them. Music's in the foreground, lots of instruments playing, slightly different tunes. Um, you start getting things that we would call sidebands. Horror films use noisy female screams while sad films suppress them. So, you know, successful composers and sound engineers have capitalized on, they, they understand our inner marmot. And they understand, you know, what evokes emotions. 
and they've capitalized on this to, we believe, evoke emotions. Now it turns out that this is all correlative and we have just finished um, composing a series of um, clips. One of Peter Kay, one of his, uh, my collaborator, one of the, the gigs he did a while ago was he made 10 second films for MTV. <laughs> it turns out in 10 seconds you can convey a lot of information and music's really important in conveying that. So we have really simple things. Person walks, man walks, makes right turn, man walks, makes left turn, woman walks, you know, whatever. Turns pages, lifts up phone, answers phone. And, you know, think about it. If you've got some sort of sad music and, you know, you pick up the phone and say hello and you ask people, you know, what's going to happen next or you have them wired up, which is what we hope to be doing soon, um, you know, they're probably going to say, oh, well, they're going to hear sad n news. And if they hear really, you know, scary stuff, oh, something bad's going to happen. If they hear sort of benign music, you know, we'll, hopefully we'll see. Um, so we're just getting ready to, to work with everyone's favorite um, experimental subject, uh, undergraduate psychology students at <laughs> universities. Um, we know everything about humans from studies of, you know, 18 to 21 year old um, psychology students. Um, so we're about to work with those and uh, stay posted. Um, you know, we'll let you know. So, talked about a lot of things today. <laughs> Let's wrap up. Um, if you learned nothing else tonight, um, marmot alarm calls communicate degree of risk, not predator type, and they do it by a variety of different mechanisms. Behavioral diversity is just as interesting as biodiversity. When we lose species, we lose behavioral diversity as well as biodiversity. Alarm calls may be individually distinctive, and this distinctiveness allows receivers to assess caller reliability. I think it's generally important to assess caller reliability, and again, I think there are a number of different ways to do so. To me, the million dollar question now is, what explains why we see some species doing one thing and then other, spe other species doing other things? What's the evolutionary ecology of this, of this phenomena? <coughs> Screams contain nonlinearities to communicate fear, <coughs> and that fearful and emotionally evocative sounds are characterized by nonlinear acoustic elements, and humans can capitalize on these, we think, to um, elicit emotions. Thanks for coming out on St. Patty's Day, and I hope you have something to talk about at the pub later on. I'd be delighted to try to answer any questions you have. Yeah. Have you ever had a marmot older than nine days old scream? Have I ever, I'm going to repeat these for the TV folks. Have I ever had a marmot older than nine days old scream? No. Um, they're pretty vulnerable when they first come out. But we see even the older ones who are still pretty vulnerable get decimated by predators as well. At Rumble, we had a fox couple move in and they ate all the pups in town and down about a kilometer um, several years in a row. So they're pretty, they're pretty easy hunting. Yeah. Have you looked at any relationship? I'm just this off of marmots and pikes kind of sharing some of the same uh, habitat. Have you looked at any relationship between a pike call maybe influencing the marmots? Have I looked at relationships between pikas and marmots and what they say and how they, when they share the same habitat, what happens? I think interspecific communication is one of, you know, communication between species is one of the most interesting questions going right now. And I have looked at other bird species mostly um, and looking at interspecific communication of those and birds and lizards. Um, people have looked at um, ground, uh, cal uh, oh, Damn, um, ground squirrels, the, the golden mantle ground squirrels and marmots. And a colleague did a really interesting experiment. Um, so first he did playback experiments to the marmots and the ground squirrels. And it turns out, you know, anything that scares a marmot probably should scare a squirrel, but the reverse isn't true. So squirrels pay more attention to marmot calls than marmots pay attention to the squirrels. But then they, you know, so that's, that's the main take home message. Um, but it got a little more interesting than that, but that's, that's the main take home message. So it seems that animals should be listening to other species when they can acquire information about um, risk in the environment. And I suspect marmots do listen to pikas, and I suspect pika probably listen to marmots more than not. Um, one of my locations, one of our locations, used to have um, a lot of pika living on it, and they, that location went extinct. The pikas went extinct there. The marmots are still there. Pikas flick in and flick out, marmots flick in and flick out. Um, what you need is big chunks of habitat so you can maintain enough of these subpopulations that flick in and flick out. And you need to have the ability of, these, of animals to move between these subpopulations. But it's sad because now I can't ask that question. Yeah? Is that what 
is going on with the populations that are going extinct on the Olympic Peninsula and Vancouver Island? Are they losing habitat? No, Olympic Peninsula and Vancouver Island aren't losing habitat. They're, they seem to be threatened um, by predation in, in, the, in the most immediate sense. Um, coyotes seemingly have gone up to the high parts of the Olympic Peninsula more in recent years than they have in the past. Maybe this is facilitated by it becoming warmer. Vancouver Island is a more complex story. Um, most of the, well, when I was working there, um, the place where pretty much all the marmots were known um, was privately owned by um, logging companies. And logging companies um, were doing high alpine logging. I mean, these are really rugged areas. They had helicopters there pulling trees out. The trees were worth a fortune. Um, and the basically, they cut these logging trails and made these clear cuts, and they saw marmot populations increasing. But the predators traveled the roads. So Vancouver Island has a growing population of wolves. It has a huge population of cougar. And the predators were traveling the roads right to the marmot colonies. When you would sit on top of one of these mountains, the, the, the location of these high alpine peaks was, is also very small. And you could watch eagle, one eagle, fly from peak to peak to peak and sort of swoop down and make attacks at marmots um, you know, in a very small area. So in these small areas, um, one individual predator can have a huge impact on a whole population, much as one individual fox family has really put a crank in a bunch of marmots at, at, at Gothic, which is interesting. So predation seems to be important in both of these. Yeah. What do marmots eat? What do marmots eat? Mm -hmm. A lot of things. Vegetables. Um, the short answer is they eat a variety of things. They really like. Uh, uh, they really like. They really like a lot of things. They, I mean, it sort of depends on the time of year. So the first things they start eating are the grasses that emerge early on. They eat grasses because those are the first things to green up. Um, they really like dandelions, which are probably an invasive species in most places where marmots live. Um, but they eat a lot of uh, legumes and other things as well. The million dollar question, and, and from some species, other species of marmots, people have found out that, well, let me back up. If you're a hibernator, you gotta put on fat and you have to store oil. And the fat's for insulation and the oil's to burn to keep you warm over the winter. Um, burning fat takes too much energy. So marmots double their mass during the summer. And it's really important for them to double their mass because they have to survive an unknown amount of time underground when they're not eating. Um, it turns out that different plants at different times of the year produce different sorts of fatty acids. So it's not just about what they're eating, it's probably about what they're eating and when they're eating it to lay down both this fat and also this oil. So for yellow-bellied marmots, we know more about what they eat, but we don't have the, inter inter you know, the, sort of the, the complexities worked out. And it's really hard to do that. I mean, you really have to see what they're eating um, you know, when they're in a the meadow. And the meadows here, particularly the subalpine meadows, you really can't see what they're doing when the vegetation grows up by July. It's hard to see what's going on. Um, you know, sp um, Spermophilus ground squirrels are, eat, eat seeds. Yellow-bellied marmots might eat flowers, but they're, they're not really eating the seeds. They're getting their moisture from the vegetation and when it droughts. So our marmot population's um, three times bigger than it's ever been. Um, we're having a population explosion. All sorts of interesting things are happening. We're thinking it's because everything's melting earlier. It's giving them a longer growing season, more time to lay down fat, more time to recover from reproduction. Um, the, so, you know, is climate change good for marmots? Maybe right now it is. The long-term forecast for this area are that it's going to be hot and dry, and um, droughts and heat kill marmots. So the summer droughts, when we have a summer drought, if it doesn't rain in July, if the monsoon doesn't come to us this year, our population will crash. So we know that from previous crashes. Yeah? What do marmot burrows look like? I'm, what do marmot burrows look like? I've never been inside a marmot burrow. Um, I suspect they're kind of forked and go in quite a distance. Um, I've worked with people who've put instrumentation in marmot burrows to look at what's going on in hibernation. And what they did was they duct taped pool tubing um, to their tail and then sort of let them run in and they pulled this tubing in and you know 30 feet of tubing went in this burrow um, and then the marmot would groom it off and then they had a, a, a smooth pipe through which they could put um, you know temperature data loggers in and pull them out and check oxygen consumption and things like that so there are probably multiple chambers um, Russians Soviets used to study marmots a lot uh, the, the marmots in Russia um, and, and Eurasia are big plague vectors. 
and they were interested in them to prevent people from getting plague. And they also were interested in weaponizing the plague and other diseases that animals had. Um, so there were a lot of studies of marmot population biology there, and there they would excavate whole burrows and look at the, you know, look at the structure. Yeah? How long do they hibernate? Marmots hibernate. Um, it sort of depends on the elevation, but usually seven to eight months. So in a four to five month growing season, they've got to reproduce, they've got to recover their own mass, their kids have to gain sufficient mass to survive the winter, and pretty much everyone else has to double their weight. Um, yeah? Several years ago, I was hiking up in the Tetons, and the uh, car with a ranger was giving a tour guide, and he mentioned that some of these so-called uh, marmots would be hibernating, and pine martens would crawl down their sides and get warm and cuddle up with them. And then, unfortunately, for the marmot, in the spring, the pine martin would wake up sooner and he would have lunch. Do martens hibernate? No. I, I thought they were active all winter. Maybe I got, maybe I got it wrong. Well, animals do dig them out of their burrows. Um, and, you know, people in, uh, have watched um, bears dig them out during hibernation time um, when the ground wasn't covered with snow. So. Um, I think they, they do worry about that when they put a lot they put plugs in their burrows and I suspect they wake up. We hibernated, we borrowed animals from Rumble and brought them to a lab in Kansas and looked at their hibernation physiology and then brought them back when we were finished and put them back in the field. But um, the yellow bellied marmots are the most efficient hibernators. They lose a gram of body mass a day during deep torpor. So they might have two kilos to lose, but they're only losing a gram a day when they're in this deep hibernation. Um, during the winter, they wake up from hibernation. And, you know, this is one of those things that as I age, I sort of have a new interpretation of this. A fundamental question, I kid you not, in hibernation biology, is do animals wake up to pee or do they pee because they wake up? And it's a non-trivial question <laughs> because you have to get your kidneys functioning, you have to have sufficient blood pressure, so you've got to be awake. But maybe the process of waking up makes anyway. So, um, so they wake up and then they go back down. And these torpor bouts start where they're going down, sort of down meaning closer to ambient temperature. Um, and uh, they start shallow and short and they go deeper and longer and deeper and longer. In the middle of the winter, they're 10 to 14 days long. And then towards the spring, they get shorter. They probably pop up and look out periodically and then go back in um, until they emerge. Yeah? How many pups do marmots have and what's the survival rate? Uh, how many pups do marmots have? 50% survival rate. Um, our population, you, the mean used to be about three and a half, now it's about four and a half. Mm -hmm. So over the 50 years it's changed. Yeah. Do the pups nurse um, the mother and if first do they nurse? I mean like milk? Yeah, yeah they're okay. mammals so the so mothers produce milk. they make, does that mean because they're hungry? Because that's what baby bears will do and they found out in the den. And scream like crazy until they get so I, you know, a good thing and a bad thing about marmots is they don't say a lot of other things loudly, so I don't really know what they're saying. So they, the you, might be one of yeah, except they only do it when we're holding them, or they do it when we see a fox get them. Sometimes we have, have walk-in live traps. The pups just oh. walk in. Oh. Um, we put horse food in the, for the rest of them. Oh. Give them a little meal. Oh. Put them in a conical handling bag. Tie that up. Weigh them check their ear tags or give them ear tags, put various marks on their back so we can try to tell them apart. Um, sometimes take some blood, okay. let them go. Yeah? Since you've noticed the population explosion, are you starting to see any impact on the native vegetation in the area? Are you starting to see more plants and flowers and Missing? Yeah, very good question. Yeah. So, you know, it does this marmot population explosion. Yeah. Is this leading to changes in the flowers? So. I guess I'm sort of biased because when I worked in Pakistan, when I worked in this high alpine meadow, if you went out at the height of the growing season in July and clipped stuff, and I used to run Earthwatch-like expeditions and bring wonderful people out to help me clip vegetation in the high mountains, <laughs> they're like, wait, this is a beautiful place. Can't we trek? No, clip. Thank you. Um, you know, there, is, well, there was 30 to 60 grams per square meter, which isn't much. And some friend described the place as, you know, it's high alpine desert. They're like, what are these, terivores? Are they eating dirt? I mean, there's nothing to eat here. Um, by contrast, at Rumble, in these subalpine meadows at least, um, we have 300 to 600 grams per square meter at the height of growing season. Um, there's no, you know, lack of food for them to eat. If you look for sort of the ecological impact of ground squirrels um, or marmots, it often is very localized. 
So you will see different plant species living very close to burrows. I mean, right outside the burrows, and the main burrows at least, it's going to be denuded. And then you'll see some disturbance-tolerant plants, or maybe things that don't taste as good. And then as you go farther out, you'll see other things. But the, the sort of ecological footprint of an individual marmot isn't that great. So there's no obvious, um, marmots aren't eating all the flowers. CB is still the wildflower capital of Colorado. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah? I might have missed something, but tell me how mushrooms and the plague connect. I don't understand what you're saying. So plague is a big problem in Eurasia, uh -huh. and marmots are one of the plague vectors. And, marmot, when, and people eat marmots and hunt marmots and live near marmots. So there have been horrendous outbreaks of plague in, in the former Soviet Union. Now, during the Soviet, Union, Soviet times, marmot hunting was banned, um, but they still were interested in what causes these population explosions of plague, what causes you know, a disease epidemic to break out in various areas. Um, the Mongolians um, traditionally um, ate marmots and sold fur to, fur to Russians. So there's this huge record, demographic record, of how many skins were sold that goes back about 120 years from Mongolia um, to Russia. Now, when the Chinese came into what's called Inner Mongolia, um, the Mongolians had a very highly evolved way of hunting marmots without getting plague. They would put on Playboy bunny ears, I kid you not. They would take a yak tail and they would wave the yak tail and the marmots would stand up. And if the marmots stood up and whistled, they would shoot it. <coughs> And if the marmot didn't stand up and whistle, they wouldn't. <laughs> Turns out the um, Chinese coming into Inner Mongolia had no such scruples, and, they all, and there were huge plague epidemics that killed a lot of people um, that was centered on the marmot hunters. So what's interesting is it turns out that you know, sick animals don't vocalize. At Rumble, we've done work with, with uh, birds, and we've asked questions about you know, the parasites that birds have how do the parasites the birds have influence the structure of the song? And it does. And then we've asked questions about not even disease, but can an immune response cause influence song? And it does. It shuts the birds down. Um, if you artificially inject antigens, antibodies, to get an immune response, no disease, um, they stop singing, or if they sing, these are white crowned sparrows, or if they sing, they sing really deformed songs for a couple of days, and they're, then they're fine. Um, plasmodium, malaria. Um, they sing at lower rates. And female sparrows care about the rate and the quality of the song. So disease can influence this. So anyway, Mongolians and marmots. Yeah? What's the life expectancy of a marmot? What's the life expectancy of a marmot? Um, most of them die their first year. Um, so, you know, on average, half of them are dead. The oldest we have in the field um, is a female that lived to 16 years. Um, 16. Most of them don't live that long. Males, the oldest male we ever had was 11. I actually watched him almost, I mean, I, I sort of was there when he died, which was very sad, because it was a really snowy spring. He comes out in April. You know, he's, he was, he's been arthritic for a couple of years. I mean, we don't have 10-year-old males. You know, we don't have 9-year-old males. We don't have 8-year-old males. So males come in, they do their thing for a couple of years, and they, they wear themselves out. This guy was getting more and more decrepit every year. And uh, he, he also, he had, he had his wife, who was a real piece of work, he would go up and he would greet his wife, his main wife, and she would hit him on the nose. And then he would look around for his daughter, who he was sleeping with, which is another story, and, and, and chase her. It was hysterical. Anyway, I like this guy. So he, would, even if he was sleeping with his daughter, he was a nice guy. And he would come up, and he came up and it was snow covered, and I saw him, and then we had a blizzard, and then I never saw him again. And he was 11 years. So, yeah. Yeah. Marmots, their chasing patterns have a lot to do with like their mating rituals. Do you, I, I just remember seeing this in a book once, and like they chase them three times, and then they make a noise or something. You, get, you, heard it or you know, I I I I sit out there in the spring in the snow, like l living for this stuff, and I just don't see it. You know, every once in a while I think I see it, and it's like, but she's not fertile, and those are two guys. Um, I think they play underground, and I think they mate underground. And every once in a while, we think we see sex above ground, but I think they're smart, and they take it underground where it's safe. Because the coyotes are out there in the spring. <laughs> All right, so if we don't have any more questions about Robo Badger or Eagle Knievel, I'd like you all to join me in thanking Professor Dan Blumstein. <laughs>